Thank you. So welcome, everyone. This is one of the truly great moments of the year at Bowdoin. And I know all of you know that. That's why the room is always packed. It is so fabulous to have so many of our alumni uh, back and to have our students here as well. Uh, it is also um, a, a remarkable reminder of how Bowdoin changes lives. It's something that I talk about often when I'm out with alums, almost, well, to a person, uh, each of you has a story about how Bowdoin changed your life. And today is, in a sense, a way that kind of time evaporates and we're able to understand how Bowdoin uh, is changing lives today through the experience of our students who are here. Uh, and to those uh, among uh, who are here today, uh, who are our alums and parents as well, who have been so generous in providing financial aid, I want all of us to thank you so very much for doing that. So Financial aid is a, uh, at the core of who we are, our values, uh, and it is what allows us, as we have been able to do uh, over a long stretch of time, to bring the most amazing, exceptional students to Bowdoin and continue to do that year after year after year. And it is uh, only through your remarkable generosity that we're able to do that, and through that, remain the exceptional college that we are. So thank you for that, and today is one way of celebrating that. Before I introduce Ms. Elenia, I do want to do one other thing. I'd like to ask the seniors in the room to stand, please. Congratulations. Most of you will graduate in 10 days. <laughs> um, that was a joke. So it is my great pleasure to introduce one of our a cappella groups. I suspect many of you have heard them, uh, if not on one occasion, on many occasions. But uh, Miscellanea, they are the oldest all-female group on campus, formed in the early 1970s, not long after we went co-ed. Uh, and I was just talking to them about this, but they recently uh, performed and were taped and were part of a PBS television show called Sing That Thing uh, and did an awesome job. So, miscellanea. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to President Rose for that wonderful introduction and for all of you for being here today at this really amazing event. Um, we're miscellaneous. We're so grateful to be here. Um, and I just want to say on behalf of myself and everyone in the group, thank you so much to the donors for your incredible generosity. I know that I wouldn't be here without you. And we're just glad to share in this wonderful afternoon. And we have a couple songs for you.
Making my way downtown, walking fast, faces past, and I'm homebound. Staring blankly ahead, just making my way, making my way through the crowd. And I need you, and I miss you, and now I wonder if I could fall into the sky. Do you think time would pass me by? Cause you know I'd walk a thousand miles if I could just see you tonight. It's always times like these when I think of you, when I wonder if you ever think of me. Cause everything's so wrong and I don't belong Living in your precious memory Cause I need you and I miss you And now I wonder if I could fall into the sky do you think time would pass me by oh cause you know i'd walk a thousand miles if i could just see you tonight and i i don't want to let you know I, I drown in your memory. I, I don't want to let this go. I, I don't. Make my way downtown, faces pass, walking fast, and I'm homebound. Staring blankly ahead, just making my way, making my way through the crowd. And I still need you, and I still miss you. And now I wonder if I could fall into the sky. Do you think time would pass? us by cause you know i'd walk a thousand miles if i could just see you oh, oh if i could fall into the sky do you think time would pass me by cause you know i'd walk a thousand miles if i could just see you if i could just Hold you tonight. Thank you. We have one more song for you. Enjoy the rest of the semester and yeah. like final yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more song for you, but again, thank you so much for having us. Um, to all the students, good luck on finals. And to all the alumni and donors, thank you so much again.
lives here anymore. Old memories come whistling like the wind through the walls and the cracked window panes, and the grass is growing high around the kitchen door. Nobody lives here anymore. The sun's going down in the Carolina pines. I'm a long way from home and I miss that love of mine. Broken windows, empty doors, nobody lives here That was fantastic. Thank you, Miss Elenia. We have two speakers this afternoon, one of our alum, David Morales, and one of our students, Phoebe Thompson. I'll do a brief introduction of each of them, and then David will come to the podium, followed by Phoebe. David Morales, class of 1997, served as the Executive Vice President, Chief Strategy Officer, until recently for the Steward Healthcare System in Boston. Commissioner of the Massachusetts Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy, and before that was Deputy Chief of Staff and a senior advisor to uh, Governor Patrick, uh, sorry, Deval Patrick in, uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, David graduated from classical high school in Lynn, Mass. He was a sociology major here, played football, served on Res Life, the student executive board, and graduated magna cum laude. You're a busy guy. He was awarded the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Cup for the student whose vision, humanity, and courage most contributed to making Bowdoin a better college, and the a Andrew Allison Haldane Cup for a member of the senior class with outstanding qualities of leadership and character. He served on the Alumni Council from 2002 to 2006, was a member of the President's commi Visiting Committee from 09 to 12, and was elected to the Board of Trustees in 2012. Phoebe Thompson class of 2018, an Earth and Oceanographic Sciences and Hispanic Studies double major from Whipple, Ohio, a Sarah and Bo James Bowden Scholar, admissions senior interviewer, leader of the Coalition for Expanding the Reach of Earth Science, member of the Multicultural Coalition, Bowden Queer Strait Alliance, and the Operations Coordinator for the Office of Events and Summer Programs, also a teaching assistant for oceanography, a researcher at the Scripps Institution for Oceanography, and a proctor in Howell House. You are an underachiever, Phoebe. <laughs> a couple of fun facts about Phoebe. Her parents, her dad is here with us today, um, are writers and birders. He is the editor of Birdwatcher, I believe. Do I have that right? A Birdwatcher's Digest. And I confirm this at lunch. She is named after a bird, the Eastern Phoebe. Um, and not surprisingly, you were the recent champion of the Bowdoin Birdathon, so well done. And hot off the press, but yesterday, while she was out with Professor Ressler uh, as a teaching assistant in oceanography at the Giant Steps, 
She learned that she uh, was awarded a Fulbright scholarship and will be spending next year teaching in Spain. So bravo, Phoebe. <laughs> David, all yours. told Clayton and Scott that I was not up for this and I, I would absolutely get back at you guys and I will. I will. Well, first of all, thank you, President Rose, trustees, senior staff, administrative leaders, professors, students, dining services, who I remember very fondly. Thanks for the log today. <laughs> Alumni, donor and friends and parents, I'm honored to speak at today's scholarship luncheon. Today we celebrate the generosity of our alumni and friends, as well as the profound impact of, our, of your financial support on the lives of our former, current, and future students. My personal journey to date illustrates the power of a Bowdoin education. The story of how I arrived to the United States is probably similar to many of your story in this room. I was fortunate to have parents who prioritized their family and who worked tirelessly to pursue a better life for their children. I grew up in Puerto Rico until the age of 11. We lived in Dorado, a town in the northern part of the island. I was blessed to have grown up on the mountainous part of the town. On weekends, my father, my two brothers, and I used to climb the hill in the backyard to find yautia, yuca, plantains, etc. The hillside was essentially our grocery store as it supplied our weekly fruits and root vegetables. Our protein was made up of crabs or fish that my father caught or eggs from our chicken coop in the backyard. My parents worked multiple jobs to make ends meet. During the weekday, my parents were out working from early morning to late at night. And my sister Diana, who's 10 years my elder, was my second mother. She managed the chores, cooked our meals, prepared my clothes, mainly hand-me-downs for my brothers, and kept my brothers and me in line every night. Sometime in the early 1980s, my father left Puerto Rico to find work that could improve our family situation. I remember to this day how much I miss my father. In fact, I still own the notebook where I wrote a bunch of poems about my father wishing he was home. Notwithstanding the financial challenges, my time in Puerto Rico laid the foundation for who I am today. In 1986, my mother, my siblings, and I joined my father in Lynn, Massachusetts, a small city north of Boston. My father picked us up at Logan Airport in a blue Ford Pinto and brought us to our new home, a modest two-bedroom apartment on the third floor of a rundown triple-decker on Henry Avenue. At the time, Lynn had one of the highest crime rates in Massachusetts per square feet. Empty liquor bottles and cracked vials littered the sidewalks and the playgrounds. Lynn was certainly a tough city, and I have many personal examples of how Lynn contributed to my grit and my resolve. One such example took place a few days after we arrived in Lynn. Harrington Elementary was about two and a half miles from our house, and my mother and I had to walk there to enroll in school. As we walked to Harrington, three boys started picking on me and throwing rocks at us. I didn't speak a word of English, but I quickly communicated using my fist that morning. Unfortunately, in those days, altercations were part of the norm in Lynn. I attended Breed Junior High School. Looking back, I wasn't the best student, but I wasn't the worst either. I was only suspended twice from junior high school. I'll spare you those stories. My seventh grade math teacher, Mr. Smith, routinely told Greg, a friend of mine, uh, uh, in front of many of the other students, almost daily, that we would end up flicking bur flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. And boy, how I got back at him years later. For high school, I attended Lynn Classical, a public school located in West Lynn, the roughest part of the city. Student body at Cooley High, as we called it, consisted of mostly low income and working class students on the wrong side of town. That distinction meant that many of us had a big chip on our shoulder, which often manifested itself either on the school grounds in fights or on the football field. I signed up for tackle football my freshman year in high school. Football literally transformed my life. It kept me off the streets, helped me to channel my frustrations in a very positive direction, and ingrained teamwork, discipline, and tenacity in my DNA. Thanks to a lot of work and mentoring, I became an all-star uh, all scholar athlete in the region. My football coach at the time, David Dempsey, played a key role in that part of my journey. A no-nonsense type of person, Coach Dempsey was a mentor who always found time for his team on and off the field. 
In fact, Coach Dempsey personally helped me identify colleges and universities and drove me multiple times to area colleges to make sure I understood that there was indeed a next step for my life after classical. In December of 1992, I experienced a transformative moment, which I hardly rare, uh, share with people. Late one night, I found my father sitting at our kitchen table. I asked him why he was upset. My father would not make eye contact with me. For context, my father's my hero. He's a veteran who embodied respect, work ethic, and integrity. Yet, he was my hero sitting at the kitchen table, vulnerable. Seeing him in that condition was mind-blowing to me at the time. I was 240 pounds, very athletic, and my father was a very tough guy. My father told me he had lost his job and that he wasn't sure how he was going to pay the rent or the bills or keep the, the apartment. I told him not to worry because I would skip college and find a job. I had a plan. I always had a plan. My father's response changed my life. He sternly said, there's no way. You have to go to college. I do not want you to be like me. I vowed that day to do whatever necessary to help my family transition out of poverty. The next day, I told Coach Dempsey about my conversation with my father. I needed to find a job. College was not in the plans right now. His response was immediate. You're going to college, end of discussion. I'll call your parents. Because of my low SAT scores, the coach and I were not sure any school would admit me. Dempsey suggested that we focus on a few NESCAC schools, with Bowdoin in particular for three reasons. And this was his rationale at the time. Bowdoin didn't require SATs. Bowdoin had an exceptional reputation. And Bowdoin had a need-blind financial policy. I remember receiving my acceptance letter to Bowdoin. My parents were beyond proud. Coach Dempsey and I were relieved. <laughs> Although I have to admit, my parents had no idea about Bowdoin. My mother asked me how I was going to commute to Bowdoin uh, on the, to the Blue Land train in Boston. I didn't have a car. I said to mom, we'll figure it out. <laughs> I arrived on campus late of uh, 1993 August for football camp. I owned two pairs of shorts, two pairs of jeans, a bunch of t-shirts and a pair of sneakers. I also had a triple fat goose coat, which I owned for like six years at the time. <laughs> I was in awe to see students my age driving brand new Jeeps and Saabs, as well as weird looking footwear I'd never seen before, Birkenstocks and L.O. Bean shoes. <laughs> I'll spare you the details, but my first semester was a culture shock as well as challenging. I was accustomed to Lynn's neighborhoods where my peers spoke multiple language, languages or had varying shades of skin color. Well, not here. I put on a good face publicly, but I didn't fit in and I struggled academically. My first semester, I had two pink slips from Professor Kaplan, my faculty advisor. I had been in two off-campus fights and my driver's license suspended and I had very little common with most students on campus. Toward the end of my first semester, Bowen stepped in to help, help me with a student mentor. Hurley Roseman, Haitian-American woman and my classmate, became not only my tutor, but also to this day, one of my closest friends. I'll not detail my four years at Bowdoin, but suffice it to say, this small college transformed my life and enabled me to blaze a pathway out of poverty. Bowdoin was also a catalyst for deep personal change critical thinking skills, a rigorous work ethic, as well as a burning passion for a mission-driven life. Moreover, Bowdoin exposed me to people from all sorts of backgrounds and places I would never have been exposed to. Also, Bowdoin also gave me an opportunity to leverage experiences like football, fraternity life, campus life as a student and a proctor, build a blues band, a Latin music radio show, among a host of other things I was able to experience here. Bowdoin also handed me another wonderful gift, lasting relationships with professors and alumni that continue to deeply, deeply enrich my life. Professor Susan Bell, Penny Martin, Craig McEwen, Kent Shabatar, John Turner, and many friends who to this day I consider brothers and sisters like Hurley Roseman, Tim Ryan. He asked me not to mention his name, but I did. <laughs> Ryan Dunn, Tony Tixier, Dave Bass, My Lamb, Toby McGrath, and many others, Joel Sherman, etc. Finally, Bowden has played an instrumental part of my career. Because of my Bowdoin degree, the Chairman of Ways and Means Committee in Massachusetts selected me for my first job as a budget analyst out of 70 applicants. Since that first job, my Bowdoin education has enabled me to serve two governors, one Democrat, one Republican, advise a Speaker of the House and a Senate President, respectively, implement prescription advantage and shape the creation of Medicare Part D, play a key role to date in Massachusetts healthcare reform for the past 15 years, 
Craft a Life Sciences Center initiative in Massachusetts, which is now a multi-billion dollar industry in Massachusetts. Worked for seven years as an executive at Stewart Healthcare, building the nation's privately held healthcare and hospital company. Serve as a trustee to this amazing college, buy a home for my parents and my family, and more importantly, share a blessed life with the most amazing woman, my wife, Samanda, be a father and a role model for two amazing boys. In closing, I thank all of you, alumni, trustees, administrators, professors, dining services, students, my former classmates. Because of you, boating is welcoming, unique, and powerful. To our alumni and donors and parents, thank you for your commitment to the college. Your generosity makes it possible for all students, regardless of their color, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or class, to have access to the highest level of education in America and an opportunity to build a future, a successful future for themselves and their families. I urge you to continue your support of our college and its mission. As our country confronts profound social, economic, and demographic change in a highly diverse and competitive global economy, your generosity and stewardship matters now more than ever. Thank you very much. It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to President Rose for the introduction. It's a big relief to not be announced as still unemployed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to David for sharing your incredible story. That's truly inspiring. Um, I also want to thank the offices of stewardship um, and events, dining, facilities, housekeeping, and everyone else who's making this happen today. Through my campus jobs, I've been really fortunate to get to know a lot of the people who work behind the scenes to make this campus tick. I'm so honored and humbled to be standing up here today. I actually have perfect attendance at this luncheon, so after listening to speakers the last four years, I can't believe that I'm actually the one up here now. To be here with all of you is a really beautiful part of my finale at Bowdoin. I finished classes yesterday. I've been penning love letters to this school and its community in my head for a while now trying to make sense of my emotions before I leave. I could give multiple speeches built around moments that made my heart burst, or funny anecdotes. However, in, true, in order to truly express the depth of my gratitude for the people and resources that brought and kept me here at Bowdoin, I need to introduce you to where I'm from. I was born and raised in the Mid-Ohio Valley, nestled in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. It is rural, it is insular, it easily could have been the model for the portrait painted by J.D. Vance in Hillbilly Elegy. Breaking news is often about a meth lab bust. I know people who have lost loved ones in the heroin epidemic. School was called off several days each year in deference to hunting season because so many students would have skipped anyway. But attendance was always perfect on drive your tractor to school day. <laughs> Everyone and their mother, literally, would line the school drive to watch the tractors roll past, American and Confederate flags waving side by side. The drivers would park, dismount, and carry their feed sacks turned backpacks into school just as the bell rang. At the end of every school day, my little brother and I would ride the bus through the valleys and the haulers for roughly two hours each way, memorizing every single word to every single country song that played on the radio through osmosis. The bus dropped us off at the intersection of Stanleyville and Dalzell Roads, where my mom waited in her Subaru, listening to NPR. On a nice spring day, we might have taken a quiet walk down to the nearby pond, which was always full of frogs and newts. I wrote my main college application essay on this school home transition, realizing that I grew up in two completely different worlds. My parents have managed to build careers around what they love to do. My dad, among many things, is the editor of a birdwatching magazine, the host of a birdwatching podcast, and the leader of field trips around the world. My mom, equally versatile, is a natural history writer, watercolor artist, and volunteer songbird rehabilitator. As a child, I traveled around the country with my family to birdwatching festivals, where my parents were hired as speakers, trip leaders, and musicians. The years of my youth were spent chasing sparrows on the prairies of North Dakota, 
looking for warblers in the mountains of West Virginia or spotting puffins off the coast of this great state. So you can see where I got my name. While my childhood was unique and rich with these experiences, reality hit home for me when I began looking at the sticker prices of colleges. To no one's surprise, the cost of higher education was far outpacing the income associated with professional bird watching. I clearly remember the night of my first college acceptance to a different small liberal arts school. My mother, while obviously elated for me, shook her head and held back tears while looking at the school's financial aid offer. It just wouldn't be feasible. Then came Bowdoin's acceptance. It was no secret that this was the one I'd been desperately hoping for. I reminded my parents probably a hundred times that the financial aid was loan free, that I would never have to pay back anything Bowdoin gave to me. While my enrollment at any private liberal arts college was going to be a major stretch for our family, my parents saw how badly I wanted this. On the night we paid my admissions deposit, my dad, always the optimist, pulled me aside and promised that he would do everything in his power to ensure that I could live out this dream. This was where my experience diverged from that of my high school classmates. The social and familial dynamics of the Mid-Ohio Valley are probably best described using the old metaphor of crabs in a bucket. Basically, in a bucket of live crabs, any one of them could climb out at any time, but all of the other crabs pull climbers back down to ensure the group's collective demise. Essentially, the idea is, if I can't have it, neither can you. When I was entering seventh grade, my parents and I attended an orientation to find my locker and get the lay of the land at the high school. We were instructed to find our homerooms and meet our teachers so we'd be ready to go on the first day. The whole night is a blur, but one moment stands out clearly. I walked into the pre-algebra classroom with one of my good friends from elementary school as we had both tested into the higher level of math. Her mom chased after us and grabbed her. In front of everyone, the students, the parents, and the teacher, she yelled, what are you doing in this classroom? You know you can't do this kind of math. You belong in the basic class. The switch to math seven, mandated by her mother despite her test results, changed her trajectory for the rest of high school, ensuring that she could never take calculus. My friend went on to attend one of the large public schools in Ohio for a couple of years until she dropped out and returned to our area to live at home. Several years later, in my junior year of high school, I had my first college-related meeting with our school's one guidance counselor. I knew someone at the time who was a senior at a rigorous private academy in the East, and through him, I learned the names of a bunch of small liberal arts colleges that sounded much more appealing to me than a large university in Ohio. When I mentioned Bowdoin to my counselor, she replied, well, have you heard of Oberlin? <laughs> this desire to keep the youth of the Mid-Ohio Valley close to home was pervasive and insidious, and I heard it in the voices of my friends as we discussed our options for higher education. When I returned for spring break during my first year at Bowdoin, I ran into one of my old friends who I'd known since kindergarten. In all of the years we spent together, he never wavered in his desire to be an air traffic controller and had enrolled in a program at a college roughly two hours away to pursue his dream. I asked him how things were going, and he shook his head and looked at the ground. He said, I'm not like you, Phoebe. I can't leave this place. So they stay, and they build lives of their own in the spaces carved out for them by their parents. One third of my graduating high school class of 77 people has children of their own now, and a handful of them have two. I recently saw a post online made by one such classmate, dedicated to everyone turning 20 and celebrating the fact that they beat teenage pregnancy. Roughly paraphrased, it read, when you're 35 and awake at 3 a.m., changing diapers and making bottles, I'll be sleeping peacefully while my grown children make their own food. They got me there. <laughs> it's a different world. Meanwhile, I came here. By virtue of my parents' selflessness and faith in me, and thanks in large parts to the scholarships I received, I'm standing here in front of you today, wrapping up my Bowdoin education. I've learned about oceans and volcanoes. I've learned a romance language and a computer language. I have studied abroad, and I have learned how to write and communicate effectively. I've made lifelong friends who I love with all my heart, and I've been encouraged and supported by brilliant faculty and staff who are leaders in what they do. A couple of times, I've returned home and tried to talk with high-achieving students from my high school about the possibility of them attending a college like Bowdoin. 
The answer is always the same. They're going to stay in state because it's cheaper and closer to home. And I cannot fault them for that. No one has given them the boost to see out over the lip of that bucket of crabs. They don't know that there's generous, loan-free financial aid waiting for a student just like them. They don't know that they can put down roots elsewhere without destroying the ones they've grown over their first 18 years. To be honest, I didn't fully know that either, but I was allowed to try, and I sure found a great place to land. Because of you, I'm here. Thank you. was wow and wow. So the only thing I'm going to uh, say is uh, two things. I, I'd like us all to thank our amazing dining staff for making all of this possible today. <laughs> and to thank uh, our alumni and parents for your remarkable generosity, for making all of this happen times all of the students who have come through here. Uh, and to our students, thank you for everything that you have done to make Bowdoin a better place. Thank you for being here, uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing as many of you after this is over as I can. Thank you. <laughs>